Okay, so welcome everybody for this session of this lecture series on introduction to topological phases and transition by Professor Krishnan Usain Gupta, a cultivation of science, Kolkata. Professor Krishnan Usain Gupta is a renowned expert on matters related to condensed matter. I mean, he was endowed with many honors, including Bhatnagar Prize. And he's also well known as a great teacher. Uh, so we are very happy that he has agreed to give this lecture series. So I should tell you at IIT Gandhinagar, we have created this program where we are inviting many good physicists and give lectures on their topic of uh, expertise. And we are um, uploading this lecture series in YouTube. So these are not only meant only for our students. These are completely open. Anybody can come and join this lecture series. Of course, there will be a, only a registration process. And you can also look at our YouTube channel where many of these lectures have been posted. And it is going to be a continuous activity. And uh, just, um, fortunately, these are, I mean, very few positive things we can say about this kind that we have access to many people online. That's all. Okay, with all these words, so I'm handing over everything to Krishnandu just to say that you must have looked at the lecture schedule. Uh, there are two lectures, uh, same time, 3.30 to 5.00 on every Tuesday and Friday of every week. But there will be a gap on 7 to 11 June. There's a physics program, IIT Gandhi is a physics program. And that is why there'll be no lectures on that week. Otherwise, every week, two lectures, same time. OK, Krishna, now ball is yours. Uh, OK, thank you, Shudhita, for organizing this. And um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you guys. And uh, particularly during these times when you know travel is now a thing of the past. And uh, uh, it's, it's very hard to find uh, you know, people to talk to. So uh, this uh, is uh, sort of uh, put forward as a course. But uh, what I'm going to do, at least for today, is to give you an overview of things to come. And uh, uh, so in this lecture, I'm going to particularly cover topics which should have been in the lecture, but it's not going to. OK? Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, since I'm sharing my screen, I cannot see all of you. But at any point, if you have any questions, please stop me and ask it. Because, uh, you know, it's really through these exchanges, uh, these questions and answers, I mean, you know, that uh, everybody feels uh, accustomed with the subject. Uh, and I learn a lot from all these questions that I keep getting. Uh, so, so that's a good thing. And the third thing is that uh, this particular lecture, and, the, and this is true only for the one today, is uh, put as a brief overview of things, and it draws from many different areas of uh, condensed matter physics. So, uh, uh, particularly for the students, if anything turns out to be not absolutely clear, uh, don't get disheartened by this because uh, maybe it will show up in later lectures, or maybe you know, if you ask, I can explain. Uh, but today's lecture is particularly broad, and not everything is meant to be clear. It's more like a story. Okay. So, okay, with this, let me begin. So, what I'm going to talk today is a very brief in topological phases and phase transitions. And uh, in today's lecture, uh, it will be mainly uh, focused on, uh, you know, uh, how this uh, topological phases, it's more of a history, how these topological phases become important and what we understand about them. And of course, this story is incomplete without the, uh, without telling you about the contribution of these three gentlemen, David Thaulis, uh, Duncan Handelman, and Michael Gostelis, who uh, were one of the first to point this out, uh, to point the role of topology in condensed physics. And in recognition of that contribution, uh, they got the Nobel Prize in 2017, uh, 16, I guess, right? Yeah, 16, probably. Sorry. Uh, so, um, and so let me try to give you a brief overview of things. Okay. So first I'm going to sort of talk about generic interacting condensed matter system and classify ex oops, sorry, classify excitations in condensed matter. And this would be of two classes, topological and non-topological. And I'm going to tell you why I'm using this word topology there. 
And the simplest topological excitation that we meet in our everyday life, or at least in our everyday condensed matter textbook, is our vortices. Okay, and I'm going to discuss these vortices in context of superconductors. Uh, and then I'm going to switch gear and talk about the role of topology in quantum mechanics. And uh, this would be followed by a very brief discussion of quantum Hall effect and phase transition, which is going to prepare us for one of the main topics of today, which is coastalist Hallless transition. This is a special class of transition which doesn't abide certain characteristic of standard transitions uh, that I'm going to discuss. Okay, and then if I have time, I'm going to tell you why this Hall conductivity is a topological invariant and how this topological uh, stuff shows up in a spin system called Halden chain. And this would be our first introduction to topological physics. Okay. All of this would be, uh, you know, with, so I'm going to try to, at least for today, discuss all of this without much mathematics or without much rigor, to, so to speak. Uh, but if anything is unclear, please stop and, uh, you know, uh, ask questions. So, okay, if we go back in time, almost 100 years back, in uh, 1920 or 21, the atomic structure, uh, and this was through the decade of 1920 and 30, uh, between 1920 and 30, you know, people learned a lot about quantum mechanics and the atomic structure and the principles of quantum mechanics uh, are slowly becoming, people are slowly familiarizing them with those uh, stuff. Okay. <laughs> the theoretical community kind of diverged in two ways. Yeah. Please mute, please mute. I request them to be <laughs> Okay. So, I, yeah. So, I'll request everybody to mute their microphone and let the <laughs> Christian do. Yeah, yeah. This is fine. Okay. So, um, after that, you see what happens is that um, there were two trains of thought. One of them, one line of thought in theoretical physics was what are nucleons and electrons made of? Okay, and that line of thought took us to the discovery, took us to the road of elementary particles that we know today. And, you know, this whole um, standard model came into existence by that line of thinking. The other thought, which was not so popular in those days, not so flashy at least, but later it became uh, quite important, is that what do many nuclei and electrons mean? You see, this is a fundamental property of quantum mechanics that if you take two interacting particles, you need not be able to describe their physics just by knowing the individual properties of particles. So, for example, take a spin of particle, okay, and take another. Now, the state, the quantum mechanical state of these two spins together could have things like singlet and triplets and stuff like that, as we all know. And more importantly, can give rise to an important concept of entanglement, where, for example, if you have a singlet or a, you know, uh, if you have a singlet, you can have entangled states. So the point is that that entanglement could never come from the uh, wave function of a single spin. Okay. So many is different, you know, and that's the philosophy that this other line of thinking came about. Of course, here, since I'm talking about quantum mechanics, I'm completely going to ignore the third line of thought, which was gravity and understanding, you know, physics of uh, black holes and stuff like that, which, of course, led us to uh, our present view of cosmos. So, out of these two, of course, I'm, I can, and I'm only qualified probably to just discuss a bit about the second view, which is this, what do many nuclei and electrons make? So, more soon enough, people understood that when you have many nuclei and electrons, for example, a metal, the state of the system is an incredibly difficult concept to grasp. You know, it's not that easy to understand what uh, 10 to the power 23 electrons uh, combine them serve into. But these, <coughs> more often than not, they are better described by uh, the excitations that you can create by sort of probing this uh, many electron ground state. 
and quickly people realize that these excitations can be classified. So to the left of this uh, brown bar that one has, uh, can you guys see my cursor? If you move it, hi, I can see. Yes, yes. Okay. So you see this brown bar, right? To the left of this brown bar, there are these different uh, excitations that came in. Uh, in fact, uh, the first of these were, uh, the first non-trivial excitations were, uh, you know, of course there are electron-like excitations that we understand, but then there were holes. And this was concept which was put forward by Pyles in 1928, before the discovery of positrons, for explaining the wrong sign of the Hall conductance. You know, they were measuring this Hall conductance, as, and as you know, the sign of this conductance depend on the sign of the charge of the current carrier. And in some materials, they found that uh, it had the wrong sign. And that's why uh, Piles came out and gave this explanation. And as, sorry, as usual, as usual, he was correct. Then there were this, after this, in the 50s, came the BCS quasi-particles. Well, that is the quasi-particles which were emerging excitations from superconducting ground state. And this we are going to have a look at. And these are linear combinations of electrons and holes. Okay? So they are linear superposition of electron-like and hole-like quasi particles. Then, of course, there were phonons, which were bosonic quanta of lattice vibration. And this is analogous to you know, photons in some sense, I mean, um, except for polarization and that kind of issue, of course. But uh, these are bosonic stuff. And then People looked into systems where the spins were the main degrees of freedom, and they came up with collective wave-like excitations of the spins, which are called spin waves. Now, each of these excitations were important in their own regard. However, there is nothing topological about that. Now, the topological excitations came when, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the first hint of topological excitation came from superconductors. And when they found that if you put in a magnetic field inside a superconductor, you have vortices. And these vortices came up, came with a topological index n, such that 2 pi times n is the amount of phase that you pick up as you circle around the vortex. And this is something we are going to, which is going to be clear in subsequent uh, transparencies. And then there are skarnions and merons, and these are vortices, but they are made of spins. For example, if you had a skarmion, then you have, think of a vortex-like structure where the outermost shell has all upspins and the inner core has a downspin and the spin continuously moves from down to up as you go radially outward. And we are going to have some nice pictures about this as I go on. And then there are more exotic excitations were called composite fermions, which were understood only in the late 80s. And these are excitations which combines flux quanta with electrons, and this leads to fractionalization of electron charge. And all of this in the right has non trivial topological numbers associated with them. And this, more, import more importantly, these topological numbers essentially are responsible for the stability of this kind of excitations. And we are going to see how. So, first, uh, you know, with this background, first let's talk about superconductors and see how vortices emerge in superconductors. Now, discovery of superconductivity is something which came up uh, more than 100 years back. It's now almost 110 years. And uh, this was in the lab of, um, you know, uh, this, was, this was in the Dutch lab where uh, this, uh, the, the, Kemerlig Onis, this gentleman, so what he did was to uh, sort of able, so his ability was to liquefy helium. And having done that, he had access to temperatures which no other lab in the world at that time had. And what he was doing is that he was trying to look at the resistance of this uh, different compounds in, with this, uh, with this, you know, at this really cold temperatures. And he found that as he went below or close to this 4.2 Kelvin, it turned out that mercury, the substance he was studying, uh, has a huge drop in resistance and its resistance uh, went below the experimental measurable limit, okay, which was which he qualified as zero resistance. In his own words, mercury has passed into a new state, which on account of its extraordinary electric 
electrical properties may be called the superconductive state. Okay, and um, so the experimental finding was just that that the sample uh, resistivity dropped below experimental sensitivity, and uh, that was the first discovery of superconductivity. Uh, soon enough, within the next 20 years or so, uh, people understood that superconducting state is not just about electrical properties, it's also about the magnetic properties. So what was found is that uh, these are perfect diamagnets. In other words, if you put a reasonably weak magnetic field around that superconductor, the field lines, as you see here, are going to be expelled when the, uh, when the uh, metal or this metal block goes below the superconducting state, goes below its critical temperature and enters into a superconducting state. So the statement is that superconductors expel magnetic flux. And this was first discovered by Meissner and Oschenfeld, and uh, this was probably Meissner. And this is called the Meissner-Oschenfeld effect and was discovered in 1933. So later it was found out by London and others that in reality the magnetic field is not completely expelled, but it penetrates a small distance inside a superconductor. In fact, the magnetic field profile for certain geometries is exponential. Uh, it's an exponential decay as it decays exponentially as you go in uh, the superconductor. And the critical decay length, the characteristic decay length is uh, called the London penetration depth. Now, there are some key experiments which led to understanding phenomenology of the superconductors and led to its microscopic description. One of them is specific heat measurement. So when you measure this electro specific heat of a metal, there are typically two contributions. One coming from the phonons, that's the lattice contribution to the specific heat. And uh, the other one is electron. Okay, And that's the electronic contribution to the specific now, the former, the phonon contribution goes as uh, some constant times T cube. So it goes uh, the cubic power of temperature, whereas the latter is linear in temperature for a standard metal. So if you are a good experimentalist and you could measure this specific heat, to, uh, and then you are careful enough to subtract out the phonon part, which they can do, you would find a linear dependence of the specific heat as a function of temperature. Okay. So, and this, if the metal didn't do anything funny, this specific heat is supposed to go to zero linearly as you decrease temperature. However, when it did something funny, that is when it entered the superconducting state, what happens is that the specific heat shows a jump right at the transition temperature where the system goes into a superconductor. And if then it decreases exponentially, okay, as you uh, lower the temperature. Now, this exponential decrease is very reminiscent of a system which has a gap near its Fermi energy. And there, why is that the case? Because this is a behavior, this was seen in insulators, where if you have a gap in the Fermi energy, the specific heat goes as exponential of that gap divided by the temperature. Okay, and that's called an activated behavior. And that characteristic fit this specific heat in this low temperature region very well. Okay, so that was very suggestive of having a gap in the near the Fermi surface when the system enters a superconducting state. And this was the first hint, and we are going to see how that comes about. But uh, okay, the second experiment in superconductors, which was also very um, interesting, was uh, came from night shift measurement. So typically, when you have this kind of metals, um, you know, it, they have a nucleus. And if you put in a magnetic field to this nucleus, you have um, this magnetic field couples to the net spin of the nucleus, and this gives rise to an oscillation, the typical Larmor precision, which leads to, uh, uh, and the frequency of that is uh, well known. So it, is also, it was also well known that if you take that nucleus and you put it in a metallic environment, that is inside a metal, then there is an additional contribution to this frequency, which comes because the magnetic field not only couples to the electron spin itself, but it also couples, well, the electron spin also interacts with the spin of the 
paramagnetic uh, well spin of the electrons that is around the fermi surface so the coupling between the electronic spin around the fermi surface and the nuclear spin leads to a shift in this uh, frequency and that's called a night shift now what happens in a metal as you lower temperature well that's very simple in metal as you lower temperature you know this thing is almost a flat line and why is that the case you see typically a fermi energy of a metal uh, if you convert it into a temperature it's around 10000 kelvin okay so in your experiment you are going from something like 50 kelvin to you know close to a kelvin or so and that's a minuscule temperature difference compared to the fermi energy which is 10000 kelvin and there is no appreciable change if you change the temperature that much okay so t over tf is an and is a very very small quantity and therefore no changes happen however if you do this with a superconducting material you see that right outside right after it enters a superconducting regime which was around this 20 kelvin or so the night shift the shift in the um, resonance frequency because of the interaction of the uh, nuclear spin with the electrons around the fermi surface that decreases okay and it goes very close to zero why is this the case uh, it's as if the nuclear spins do not see those electrons near the fermi energy anymore okay so that also suggests that around the fermi energy there are no available states to these electrons and therefore uh, it is suggestive again of a gap okay so these experiments were key phenomenology key, provided key to phenomenology of superconductors now more about superconductors in a magnetic field people found out that the behavior of superconductors in the presence of a magnetic field uh, can be classified into two types the first one is uh, which applies to pure metals like sodium or uh, sorry lead or mercury um it's typically you know you have a superconductor let's say at certain temperature out here and you apply a magnetic field the superconductivity persists up to sometimes and during that time it expels this magnetic field so it's in a, a meissner regime okay and then suddenly the magnetic field wins and the superconductivity is killed and you get into the normal state and this typically happens when the magnetic the typical energy gain from uh, okay typical energy due to the magnetic field which is you know mu b times s or the orbital energy whatever is more appropriate uh, is of the order of the superconducting gap which is a typical uh, energy lowering that happens during uh, superconducting transition as we'll see so there is a critical field bc uh beyond which the thing turns on however type 2 superconductors which are typically alloys okay uh it seems it does something much more interesting first as you increase the temperature uh sorry as you increase the magnetic field at a fixed temperature first it's in the meissner phase where it doesn't allow any flux and then it allows some flux but it still retains its superconductivity and at a much higher field which is called the bc2 or the uh, critical second critical field okay uh, it goes into the normal state and between this bc1 and uh, bc2 the system has flux magnetic flux passing through the sample most interestingly these fluxes pass through the sample in quantized units in quanta of hc over 2e that's a typical flux quanta okay it does you cannot just put arbitrary amount of field inside a superconductor it always has to be an integer multiple of this basic flux quantum okay so here you have this magnetic fields penetrating the sample and these are what leads to vortices okay uh so before going into vortices further let's just discuss what is happening why are we having a superconducting state at all to understand that and i am going to be very cartoonish here okay uh, without giving any maths or any proper formalism and that's because this is not really a lecture about superconductors it's just a you know story 
just to understand the more interesting things about vortices. So, okay, so let's talk about basics of electron conduction in basics of, me, basics of electron conduction in a solid. Okay, so these electrons typically uh, move in a background of this lattice charge. Okay, now uh, these lattices are approximated in various ways by different models. One of the model is that uh, the electrons just move in a background of static ions. The ions really do not move. And that's a very simplified version of what we know as the born oppenheimer approximation, that the motion of the ions are at a much slower scale compared to that of the electrons. So you, can compare, you can consider them to be static when you are looking at the dynamics of the electrons. And it's just a charged blob which forms the background. Okay? Now, that's what is called the Drude model. And that is enough to discuss many properties, um, uh, to explain many properties of electron conduction inside a solid. However, that's not enough when it comes to a bit more complicated solid other than metals. Okay, In many cases, it is important that this lattice arranges themselves in a periodic structure. And the potential they provide to the electron is a periodic potential. It's not just a constant potential. And electrons in a periodic potentials seems to have um, gap spectrum. So you can have regions which are forbidden for these electron quasi-particles, ranges of energy which are forbidden for these electrons, and you can have ranges of energy which are allowed. And that leads to bands of electrons uh, followed by gaps. Okay, so the taking proper account of this uh, of the spatial structure of these ions uh, leads to important things such as formation of bands. Now, for superconductivity, it turns out one needs to consider a dynamic lattice. And what is the nature of this dynamics? The ions, of course, are fixed in a place, but because of quantum mechanics and also because of temperature, okay, they really cannot be completely steady. And why am I saying this? Because if a uh, these ions can be thought about as a, let's just think about it as a single charge block. It's a quantum particle, let's say, and uh, if you make it complete, you cannot really make it completely static because of uncertainty principle, even at zero temperature. And when there is a finite temperature, of course, you cannot make it static because there is always thermal fluctuations. So what does this around ions do? Well, the simplest thing it can do is to vibrate around their mean position. Okay, that vibration is not large to distort or destroy the lattice, but it's nevertheless the ions are not static, they ziggle around their average position. Okay. Now, of course, since we are dealing with quantum mechanics, these vibrations can be quantized, just as you can vi uh, quantize vibrations on a string and get your fields and do stuff. Here also, the vibration of this lattice can be quantized, and these quanta are typically called phonons. Okay. Now, Electrons interact with these phonons that is generated from the lattice. And this interaction is solely responsible for the uh, is solely responsible for these electrons to have a superconducting um, ground state. Now, how is that the case? Again, if I have if I look at a cartoon picture again, what can happen if the electrons are uh, or if these phonons are allowed to move, if the lattice is not static, if it is allowed to disturb. You see, it's a very simple two-stage process that can happen. And But before saying this, I must say that this is just a cartoon picture, okay? Don't take it very literally. The actual pairing happens in momentum space, not in real space, but this is just a cartoon representation of how the electron-electron pairing happens, which leads to superconductivity. So what happens is the following. So suppose you have a lattice out here, and imagine that there is a static electron, which is again a theoretical construct, uh, is there, which is um, you know sitting right at the center of this uh, lattice. Now, because these electrons have a negative charge and the lattice ions have a positive charge, these electrons are tend to will tend to attract the ions towards it, and therefore the lattice will buckle a little bit, and this buckling essentially means that uh, there is a higher concentration of positive charge in this rate uh, around this electron. Okay. 
Now imagine a second electron passing by. It will see that there is a higher concentration of positive charge, and therefore its trajectory is slight is going to deviate slightly as it passes through this thing. So therefore, if I just now take out the phonons or the ion lattice from the whole scenario, effectively the first electron provides an effective attractive interaction towards the second, and that's why the trajectory of the second electron just comes a little bit closer to the first. Okay. This again is a way to explain physically in real space how two electrons, although they have otherwise a very strong Coulomb repulsion, may have an attractive, effective interaction between them via lattice phonons. And this mechanism is known as Froelich mechanism. Okay, Froelich was the first person to suggest this. Now, of course, there are many questions. First of all, you know, uh, this is not. In superconductivity, in superconductivity, the way you think about things is about Fermi surface and electrons in momentum space. States are defined in momentum space, and this real space picture is not really the right picture to think about it. So, what happens to the momentum, and also what happens to the attractive electron-electron interaction between this? Um, sorry, repulsive electron-electron interaction between these two electrons. You know, isn't it? Isn't Coulomb interaction supposed to overcome any of this mechanism? Now these are the things that uh, Barding, Cooper, and Schiffer tackled, okay. And uh, through a series of seminal papers, uh, they showed that the if there is a huge Fermi surface which is present, and then there are two electrons which reside on opposite momenta of this Fermi surface, indeed, a very simple quantum mechanical calculation, which I am not going to get into the details of, because you know this is again not a lecture about superconductivity. And this was first shown by Cooper when he was a graduate student with uh, Barding, that two electrons on top of this Fermi surface can indeed form a bound state. Okay, in spite of the fact that uh, you know, uh, in spite of the fact that they, they are interacting, and the uh, reason is that uh, these these electrons, this uh, electrons on the Fermi surface. They play an inside the Fermi surface. They play a very essential role to allow for uh, this pair formation. How do they do that? The one thing to understand uh, here, uh, the simplest way to understand this is that if you have two electrons in a three D space, you know that uh, the effective interaction between these two electrons has to have a finite interaction strength, okay, for them to form a bound state. They cannot form a bound state at arbitrarily small interaction. However, in the presence of this Fermi surface, you see that the motion of the electron now becomes one-dimensional. It cannot really move in any other dimension but other than this Fermi surface, and therefore the quantum mechanics can be effectively described by an effective one-D problem, and a small attractive interaction is enough for the electrons to form the bound state. And Cooper actually did this, did a very straightforward calculation and showed this. And the pair of this electron which forms this bound state is called a Cooper pair. So this Cooper pair is a pair of two electrons at opposite momenta on this Fermi surface. Okay. And uh, so uh, what happens is that if these two electrons can form a pair. Effectively, all other electrons and lower their energy because this bound state energy is negative compared to uh, the free electron energy, which is put at zero in this calculation. Uh, so it means that these two electrons, if they form a pair, they will lower their energy. Okay, but then the question comes: you know, why just these two electrons? Any two electrons, and in fact, all the electrons can form a pair. Okay, and In fact, they do, and they form a pair. They form a bound state. This bound state is responsible for you know having the gap, and therefore a gap develops around entire Fermi surface, and that's your superconducting state. Okay. Now, once this superconducting state forms, uh, one thing to note is that in this state, the momenta they have several properties, and one thing to note. Is that in this state the momenta k and minus k of the fermions they are always paired. Okay, so uh, the state which was written down by BCS, uh, BCS 
is the superposition of an empty state and the field state where the k and the minus k are both field. The important part is you cannot have a field k state with minus k empty, or you cannot have an empty k state with minus k field. If one has to have it empty, one has to have both k and minus k empty, else both of them have to be field. That's a, a restriction for a superconducting state. Now, UK and VK denote the probability amplitude of the states with K and minus K to be empty and occupied. Now, clearly, if you superpose these two, you are violating particle number conservation. Because clearly, this state mix, mixes states with particle N and N plus 2. And this is why the superconducting wave function can have a definite phase, because phase, it turns out, is the canonically conjugate variable to particle number. And therefore, this violation of particle number is very much essential for the phase, for the system to have a global phase. Now, the probability of a state being empty or occupied approaches one as we move to higher or uh, lower energy states from the Fermi surface. So, this superconductivity, this superposition of states with empty and field k and minus k is a property of the system near the Fermi surface. As you go away from this Fermi surface, you know, our states are either empty if you are at high energy or it's completely full if you are at pretty low energy compared to the Fermi energy of the system. Now, UK and VK, therefore, can be interpreted as a probability amplitude of a state to be occupied by a hole that is empty or an electron. Okay. Uh, so, the only thing to mind, uh, keep in mind is that if k is empty, so is minus k and so on. Okay. Now, therefore, since number is violated, the ground state corresponds to same phase of all electrons. And this is a remarkable phenomenon, which I would like you to sort of think about for a moment. You see that this metal has 10 to the power 23 electrons and a good chunk of them are near the Fermi surface. Typically, you know, as a single particle physics, forget about the interaction between them, each of them will have its phase, okay, because each of them will have its um, wave function. And these phases can take on any one of infinite possible values, because phase is a continuous variable, okay. But the state that one gets into uh, allows for this phase. Uh, allows for this allows this electron to choose one particular value of this phase from this zillions of possibility. Okay, so that's why the ground state has as a definite phase. And if you can create a gradient of this phase, what Barding, Cooper, and Schiffer showed, that leads to a velocity or a current in the ground state. Also, the state is characterized by the probability of occupation or emptiness. Of the um, of the electron with k and an electron with minus k, and therefore it's characterized by this correlation function c k c minus k taken over the ground state. And as you see from this ground state, uh, you know it's an easy calculation to do, but let me not get into that. Uh, that is finite. Okay, that's a complex number whose phase is twice the phase of each electron that. Um, because each of these electrons has a phase phi by two, the total phase of this pair potential is phi. Okay? So this pair potential reflects the phase which of these electrons in the superconducting ground state. Okay, and this is also a characteristic of the superconducting ground state. In fact, it is called the order parameter of the superconducting ground state. And we are going to come, come to this concept of order parameter in a moment. Okay. Uh, before I go into this BCS theory, let me just stop here for a second and ask if there are any questions. If anything is unclear, so that I can move on. Anything which is not so clear, anything which needs to be explained, then one second. Hello, sir. Yeah. So, uh, this phase, you wrote the phi. So this is basically leading uh, to the uh, lead to the vortex. In ah, the so can you please speak up a little bit? I can't hear you. So is this audible? Yeah. Yeah. So I am just asking, like this phase phi you introduced here. So this is the thing we which are introducing the vortex in the superconducting phase. Like 
when we he was introducing what sorry uh, vortex in the superconducting no no the phase if it's a constant phase it's not yet a vortex what this vortex would be is a singularity of this phase and i'm going to come to it in a moment okay just that, that's what i'm asking actually if phi is complex here the phase is complex so no, the phase is not complex phase is a real valued number phi is a real valued number however delta is a complex quantity Okay, okay. Okay. See, delta is a complex quantity. Its amplitude is given by delta naught, and its phase is given by phi, and therefore delta naught and phi are real-valued objects. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What? Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so uh, the sixth point you mentioned, the sixth point you mentioned in this uh, slide. Yeah. So is that you are saying that the ground ground state has can have infinite number of phases? No, no, no. Usual. So what I'm saying is, I had a metal. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. The electrons are on the Fermi surface, and that's quite a large number of them, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Each of them. So suppose they are non-interacting electrons. Okay. Now, okay. so each of them will have a wave function, and that right. function will have a phase. That's the phase of the electron. Right. Now, right. Atomic phase. Each of these phases could be completely different. In fact, if you take a collection of these phases, you are going to get a bunch of random numbers. Okay. R right. Zero and two pi. But right. the beauty of this superconducting state is that out of these zillion possible possibilities, yeah, superconducting ground state picks up one single phase for all of these electrons. Okay. 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 Something we do not know. Unless we probe the superconductor, you know, phase is not a measure measurable quantity, but the gradient of phase is. Okay. 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 Yeah. 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 Got it. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. It's clear. Thank you. Uh, hi, sir. Yeah. So this part I don't think I uh, uh, do quite understand. This uh, all of the uh, electrons having the same phase. Can you elaborate that word? Because uh, so so when you say that the phase of the ground state. Uh, you are talking about the glo global phase, right? That's right. So, uh, okay, one way to understand this is that imagine that this order parameter has a finite value. Okay, so it's an expectation of C k that is um, uh, probably so. If the state k and minus k are both occupied, okay, yeah. it's going to create an empty state. And that will have a finite overlap. So you see from this wave function, it's really like u k times v k. Now suppose this is yeah. finite. Okay? So this means that this could be a complex number, right? right. This is a general complex number. So this means it has an amplitude and a phase. So suppose this yeah. has a phase. Okay. Now imagine. So this phase is a momentum independent quantity, and it's a completely uh, standard this thing. So you see that. Each of this electron C, which is like a wave function in some sense, is going to have a phi by two. Yeah. Okay. So and this has nothing to do with k. So any k I pick up, okay, is going to give you the same um, phase, and therefore all okay. the electrons are going to have the same phase phi over two. Okay. So yes, you are saying if I if I had to look at the electrons as uh, individual non-interacting particles for the moment, yeah, in case space, yeah, then then yeah, if you look then, at the electrons, see these descriptions mm -hmm. do not make sense if they are interacting. So I am not yeah. ignore that. So if you look at them as individual particles, normally they can have any phase. But, right, 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 right. But in this state, it turns out that all of their phases are the same. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thanks, thanks. I, now I understand. Yeah. Okay. Great. Other questions? No, sir. If not, let me move on. This is going to be slightly. Better. So now imagine that I have this BCS ground state, and I excite a quasi particle out of it. Now, normally, if I had a metallic ground state, you see, I would uh, excite a quasi particle, and that would behave like an electron. But it turns out, and this was shown by Bubulinov, Dijan, and many others actually at um, at that point. Uh, so um, it turns out that these electrons, um, so that these quasi particles, 
they are a combination of electron like and hole like wave function and these electrons and the hole modes are coupled by this pairing potential which is this delta which i defined in the last slide okay so it so this wave function okay this two column wave function the upper column corresponds to electron like wave function and the lower column corresponds to a hole like wave function okay but the overall wave function is neither electron nor hole it's a superposition linear superposition of electrons and holes and if you put delta equal to zero there is no superposition anymore okay then you have just two modes one electron and one hole okay now uh, you can of course solve for these uh, quasi particles and the first thing to note is that um, these quasi particles are gapped so you need to overcome this delta the amount of pairing potential in the superconducting state to excite a quasi particle okay because ek if your epsilon k is close to fermi energy your ek is just delta which means to excite this quasi particle you need at least an energy of delta okay now the other thing that comes out by diagonalizing this matrix you find that these quasi particles are described by elect uh, creation or destruction operator just as electrons and holes are described by fermionic creation or destruction operator but these creation operator for example is a linear superposition of creating an electron and destroying an hole the amplitude of creating an electron is, is u of k and that of destroying a hole is uh, v of v star of k okay notice and i want to make this distinction quite clear is that the superconducting ground state okay is a superposition of an empty state and two electron occupied state okay it's not an it's not a superposition of an empty state and an electron and hole state it's two electrons however the quasi particle which are excitations over this superconducting ground state these are superpositions of electrons and holes cooper pairs the pairs which are uh, characterized by this delta you know these are pairs of two electrons however the bubble of oh, sorry however the bubble of the bubble of quasi particles they are superpositions of electrons and holes and this need to be made very clear never uh, confuse a uh, cooper pair with a bubble of quasi particles one of them is two electrons a bound state of two electrons while the other one is a superposition of electrons and holes okay now this has a funny uh, property if i consider the charge of these quasi particles you see that of course because there is an electron this charge is uh, you know uh, okay e is negative for me so it's e times mod u k square but the hole has an opposite charge so it's u k square minus mod v k square so if u k and v k are equal they are neutral but they are charged the expectation value of charge of this quasi particle you know uh, they are not uh, they are not fixed they are going to vary as you change your k okay so they are not eigen uh, so these quasi particles do not carry a definite charge however they do carry a net spin because electrons because it's a coupling between electrons with spin up and holes with spin down but a hole with spin down is just like a spin up electron so their net spin is h bar over okay so now with all this background let me come to this vortex thing so what happens what this uh, abricosa and others showed is that so i told you that in the ground state the superconductor has a complete phase okay and this phase is a constant but this situation is disturbed when you put in a magnetic field what the magnetic field does is to create a gradient of this phase and when you go to this uh, for type 2 superconductors when your magnetic field is large compared to well when it exceeds bc1 that is the first critical field what happens is that magnetic field penetrates and you can see this picture which is this um, yellow dots that's the places where this magnetic field penetrates okay and there the phase is ill defined 
Okay, so you cannot define a phase, but around this magnetic field penetration, you can certainly define a phase at other places. Okay. These objects, okay, because of this magnetic field, they have a definite gradient of phase as you start to them. Okay. But the phase is itself indefined when you are right at the center at this red corner. Okay. So let me just show you. So if you plot, and these are called vortices. Okay, so let me just go back here. So these things are called vortices. Okay, and uh, as you are, so what happens is that as you go right above BC one, okay, there is a single vortex that penetrates the superconductor. See this picture right here. This is a this is a squid imaging. So this is actually image of a vortex done through magnetic field measurement. And now as you increase the magnetic field. More and more vortices in units of the HC over 2e, that is the flux quanta, enters this body, uh, enters this superconductor, and you have many such vortices. Now, of course, as I told you that because there is a magnetic field, there is a phase gradient, and so you can plot the direction of the oops, sorry, you can plot the direction of this phase, you know, around these vortices. And apparently, you see that they, the direction of this gradient of the phase, as you circle around the vortex, they change their direction. Okay, so and right at the center, these vortices are not this. This phase is ill-defined, and that's what gives the vortex. Now, why is the phase ill-defined right at the center? One way to understand it is that the place where the magnetic field really enters the sample, the flux line where it really enters the sample. Superconductivity is destroyed. Okay. Now we know that the superconductor is characterized by this pair potential delta, which is a phase and an amplitude. Now, if a superconductivity is destroyed at a given place, then this amplitude goes to zero. But if an amplitude of a complex number goes to zero, there is no sense in talking about the phase of that complex number, and therefore phi is singular um, at this point. Sorry, uh, phi is singular around this point. So the, vort the center of the vortex corresponds to a singularity of a phase, and therefore, this if you circle around these vortices, because there is a singularity out here, you see that grad phi dot dl is going to pick up two pi times an integer. That's standard Stokes theorem for you. Okay. Uh, you see, because this is a gradient, if there was no singularity over a closed loop around any point. It is going to pick up zero, but because of this singularity, it picks up a finite term. So this integer essentially is a characteristic property of the vortex. Okay, it doesn't depend on the details because no matter what you do, no matter how much impurity is there in your sample, no matter how how much strongly interacting this sample is, the place where the magnetic flux lines enters the sample. That that place superconductivity is destroyed. That means delta goes to zero, and that means phi as a singularity. And therefore, this singularity, the presence of this singularity, is enough to give you this grad phi dot dl to be two pi n, irrespective of how the microscopic variation of this phi is uh, far away from the vortex core. And this is why this is incredibly robust, and it is topological. Okay. Because uh, this is one of the first example of you know how topology comes in. This n is a topological index, which is an integer. So um, yeah, and so it's a characteristic of a state of a system. Okay. So this also shows that a many-body ground state, or rather a many-body state, can have non-trivial topology because you see that. Uh, our, Think of a superconductor with just one vortex, okay, out here. That state has this grad phi dot dl equal to two pi n, and therefore I can characterize that state by an uh, integer n, okay. Just as I can characterize, uh, let's say, a coffee cup with some uh, topological number, okay, uh, depending on the genus of that surface and stuff like that, which we read in typically, you know, in our algebra classes. So similarly, you can have a vortex-antivortex pair, okay, and then this would the vortex is going to correspond to uh, n equal to one, 
and an antibiotics corresponds to n equal to minus one. And as you scale this, you are going to see that the flow lines are just completely in opposite direction. So those are vortex and antibiotics of a superconductor for you. Fine, good. So this is what I wanted to say about vortex and antibiotics at this point. And this is one of the first example of topology entering a many body ground state. So uh, I'm going to stop here and any questions. So after Hello, that, sir. more complicated. Uh, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, is there a reason why magnetic field enters in a quantum uh, quantized manner? And is oh, this yes, thing sure. is related to so, why the delta pi is uh, the delta pi integration around a loop close to visible to pi n? No, I didn't get the question. So, why does magnetic field enter in a quantized way? That's what you were asking. Yes, sir. And is this oh, thing yeah, related to the delta can, pi? Uh, that's right. So, that one can show from BCS theory. You see, if you look at this BCS theory and then you can put in a magnetic field. Okay, uh, and then you do a calculation which Abacus of did in fifties. You can show that you know. Uh, so this, there is no easy way of answering this without doing the calculation. So I'm not going to try that. At least I don't know of an easy way. Uh, you can show that these flux lines come in integer multiples of H C over two e, and you know it's one flux line, two flux lines, three flux lines. That's the way it penetrates the sample. Okay. Uh, also, uh, the way and what does the anti vortex really mean here? Oh, uh, in it terms of not, uh, no, it, it it will simply correspond to a magnetic field pointing in the opposite direction. Uh, okay. Sir. Okay, so that will give you n equal to minus one, for example. So you can think of it that way. I mean, uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk about a more general thing about vortex anti vortex pair later, but uh, let me just. Um, Talk about it this way, right? But here is one more thing. So uh, one thing that I haven't said is that uh, if you now, uh, if you are going towards BC two, that is the second critical field starting from BC one, and so suppose you are right in the middle, so that many vortices have entered your sample. What Abrikosov did, and this is what his uh, you know, seminal contribution to the field is, uh, is that he showed that these vortices are going to arrange themselves in a definite pattern. So he could find out that these vortices are not really non-interacting random objects, but they interact with each other. And this interaction allows themselves, allows them to organize themselves in a lattice-like structure and the lattice would be hexagonal. Okay, so that's called an abacus of vortex lattice, and that vortex lattice essentially is experimentally has been experimentally verified. Okay, so vortices are extended objects, no doubt, but they can also be thought like quantum particles. Okay, uh, this statement of course needs clarification, and I'm not going to give you one right now. This will become clear later, but you can also think of them as a particle. Okay, or an uh, which is characterized by this number n, and uh, if you have two such particles, you are going to have a attractive or repulsive interaction between them. Okay, this n is just like a charge of that particle. So if you have a vortex, it's say negatively charged, and its anti-vortex is positively charged, and so on, so forth. Okay. into other examples of this uh, phases non trivial phases in quantum mechanics and here i am going to come up with a concept which is going to stay with us for throughout this lectures and that's the concept of a berry phase this was first pointed out by pancharatnam okay uh, the indian physicist in the context of optics and uh, berry later generalized it into a much uh, more wider context in condensed matter and that's why this is called a Berry phase. So, um, okay. So, what is a Berry phase? So, let me say I don't know any about anything about this many body stuff. This is sim simple single particle quantum mechanics, and I have a Hamiltonian which is uh, which corresponds to a quantum particle which moves adiabatically under the influence of um, the Hamiltonian H of t. Okay? And let's say at any instant. So, if I take t at some instant t naught. I know the instantaneous energies and eigenvectors. 
Of course, this is a time-dependent problem, so I cannot talk about energies generally. But at every instant, I can talk about instantaneous energy eigenvectors and instantaneous energies. Okay. So now let me take this Schrodinger equation. Okay, and expand it in uh, this instantaneous uh, eigenbasis. Okay, and if I do that and I do some small uh, maths, I I can plug this in in this uh, Schrodinger equation, and I can get an equation for this CN of T, and that equation is right here. But now look that this particular quantity, uh, if I am really adiabatic and if your system has a finite gap. And I started from a state where C n is one, and it is separated from all other states n, which is not equal to n by a finite gap. Then the only non-zero term in this sum would correspond to the one with n equal to n, okay? Because all other C n's are going to be zero because my initial wave function was um, C n equal to one, and all C n's zero. And uh, there would be very little transfer of uh, weight of wave functions. In this different, um, in, in the different states, because there is a gap and your motion is adiabatic. Now, so I make this approximation, and then I can solve for this, and then immediately you see that apart from the standard dynamical phase that you have, you also have a phase which depends on just this time derivative and not an energy. So this phase is not dynamical. That's the first point. And the second point is that suppose I install this dynamics by varying some parameters of your Hamiltonian, so lambda of t, let's say, then I can completely write this phase in terms of this lambda. So this represents dynamical. Uh, so this dynamical evolution can be of this phase. This phase can be thought as a consequence of variation of Hamiltonian parameter lambda from an initial point to a final point. Okay, this was first point, but later on by Poncelotum and later generalized by Berry, as I said. But now imagine that this comes as a phase of this wave function. Okay, and therefore, uh, but we also know that any quantum mechanical wave function in any uh, in real space, for example, if you have a magnetic field, it will have a a dot dl. Okay, a being the vector potential and dl being the length element. Okay. So I can think in terms of that in replacing dl by d lambda and call, calling this this in lambda i d lambda in lambda as some e of lambda, which is like a generalized vector potential. Okay, this is called a Berry potential. Okay, and as in quantum mechanics, standard quantum mechanics, if your endpoints are different, okay, uh, then Going from one point to the other, you pick up a phase which is path dependent. So the phase is gauge dependent; and it's not uh, particularly useful. But if you go through a closed circle, that is, if you, you know, sort of start from a given value uh, of this lambda or psi, okay, uh, and you come back to the same point after a complete cycle, then this phase is uh, closed integral a dot dl, and that. Is just a curl of the so that is just a surface integral of a curl, and this curl is called the Poncelotnum Berry field. That is uh, this Berry field, okay. And this can have physical significance because it's gauge independent. Okay, so this Berry potential is a vector potential whose lies in line integral gives you the Berry phase of wave function, and uh, this Berry field. Uh, is one interesting as a physical consequence because it's gauge independent. Okay, I'm not going to talk about this much now in this lecture, but we're going to come back to this later. Okay, and uh, we'll see that it's very important that we you so if this has turned out to be very important for classifying solids. Uh, this would be a thing that would be covered in the second or third lecture, but. Uh, But just remember that for any wave function, if I have a parameter, this particular quantity is the Berry potential in n of lambda bra n of lambda, uh, and superposed with i del lambda acting on k del lambda. Okay, so that's the standard uh, Berry phase. So now let me come to quantum Hall effect. Okay, and that's something uh, which will. 
tell us about the effect of this very phase um, in, in this kind of systems. So after understanding these vortices, people found out another system where this topological effect is uh, very important, and that is on this quantum Hall systems. So this is a physics. This um, is a physics that was found in the 80s when people made two-dimensional uh, systems of gallium arsenide, okay, which are two-dimensional electron gas. Okay. Uh, without getting into the details of that electron gas, what we can say we can first look at is a two-dimensional, uh, a single electron in two dimension, subjected to a perpendicular magnetic field. Now, this problem is something that all of you must have solved, okay? And you can show that the Hamiltonian is given by, so if I define this mechanical moment as P minus A, this Hamiltonian is given by pi square over twice M, okay? And this problem can be reduced to a Landau level, problem and the energies are that of a single harmonic oscillator. It's n plus half half h bar omega c, where omega c depends on the magnetic field and lb, which, which is the characteristic length of this thing, it depends on the inverse of the square root of magnetic field. So this is the typical length scale that you can find out in the system uh, where the electron charge is E and the magnetic field is P. That's the only length scale. Okay? So the picture of this is that you have a single Landau level, but notice that each of this Landau level is quite a bit degenerate because uh, in this Landau level, energy Ky doesn't enter. That's the transverse momentum in the y direction. However, your uh, wave function has this Ky. So in each Landau level, you can put each Landau level energy has many wave functions, each of them characterized by a KY, and that's the degeneracy of this Landau. So the question that one asks is that what is this degeneracy? How much, how many states do I have in a given Landau? So of course, if your sample is infinite, this degeneracy is infinite, okay? But if your sample is not infinite, if um, your sample is fixed. Suppose you have a sample which has length Lx and Ly in the x and y direction. How do I calculate the number of such states? Well, if your sample has a length Ly in the y direction, then clearly your momenta, spacing between your momentum states is 2 pi over Ly, okay? Because your momenta is quantized in units of 2 pi over Ly. Okay. What else do we need? We need that, you know, if your sample, if your wave function is a kosher wave function, and uh, it's, you see that this wave function has a, is a shifted harmonic oscillator. So here, this X is shifted by this quantity Ky times Lb square, where Lb square is this square of the magnetic length. So if your uh, wave function, and so your wave function is centered around X equal to Ky Lb. So this Ky Lb, this uh, center of the wave function must lie within the sample. Okay, so this Ky Lb square must be between Lx minus Lx over two to plus Lx over two uh, if the sample has a dimension Lx. Okay. So since Ky is two pi n time divided by Ly because this is quantized in units of two pi over Ly. So the total number of Ky states, therefore, can be given by Lx Ly divided by Lb square. Okay, uh, and that's because this is two pi over L. So if you just put Ky to be two pi times n divided by Ly, you are going to find that the largest possible n that you can allow is Lx Ly over Lb square which means that the density of states, that is the number of states for unit area, is just one over two pi Lb square. Okay. So this is a real simple calculation that you can do for yourself. Okay, You just need to know that the center, the shift in the center of this potential is something that uh, has to lie within the sample and that Ky, which characterizes the shift, has to be two pi by Ly times an integral. That tells you that the number of states will depend on one over two pi L B square. So this means because 
you see that lb squared 1 over lb squared is proportional to the magnetic field that means that the more you put in the magnetic field the more number of states you can put in in a given landau level because the degeneracy increases okay the density of states increases and the number of states allowed in a given landau level increases so in a quantum hull system where the number of such electrons is exactly equal to the number of um, the allowed states okay that's called an integer quantum hull effect with uh, integer quantum hull system okay that's the that's a system where uh, you have put in all your electrons in the lowest landau level and then there is no more space left so the lowest landau level is completely occupied and the other landau levels are completely empty okay and if that is the case you see that um in that case the number of electrons the density of electrons in is equal to the number of states which is this 1 over 2 pi lb square and therefore this sigma xy if you just put in if you just put in if you cancel appropriately n e and um, b from here okay by putting in this h over e b etc out here so n is the number of electrons which is equal to 1 over 2 pi lb square because you have equal number of electrons uh, as in the lowest landau level then you find that this quantity is just e square over it n is just one part okay so so the point is that whenever your landau level is completely filled your hall conductivity is quantized to e square over it okay so that's the physics of integer quantum hall uh okay so so we find that if you have a system of planar electrons in uh, a quantum hull system then its conductivity is quantized in units of e square over it fine what do we do with that so what do we do with that is that we find a very interesting uh phenomenon out here is that suppose you now have these electrons okay and they are in the bulk Fine. Now, if I look at this system in a semi-classical manner, what do I find? What I find is that they are going to have a cyclotron orbit because you know these are electrons in a two-dimensional sample, and you are putting a perpendicular magnetic field. Your force is e times v cross b, and that gives you cyclotron motion. And the radius of the cyclotron orbits is roughly the um, is roughly is proportional to um, uh, b. so uh, it's proportional to 1 over b so the larger the radius so this radius is just the magnetic length so the larger the uh, magnetic field smaller the radius okay tighter the orbit now the point is that uh this so if you convert this into the quantum picture this radius of cyclotron orbits is also uh, the extent of the wave function that is the number of um, uh, that is the length up to about which this an electron wave function decays okay uh, because that's just lb it's a gaussian wave function it decays with the characteristic length lb and that's also the radius of the cyclotron orbit now but this is all if you have a bulk sample at the edge of this sample what happens is that the cyclotron orbit cannot be completed what happens is that it start the electron starts the orbit and then it gets scattered of this edge and then it gets scattered again and therefore it exhibits what is called a skipping orbit okay it goes half the way scatters goes half the way scatters and this gives rise to a directional motion of these electrons so the bulk electrons have no directional motion it's just circular magnetized uh, a circular cyclotron orbits however at the edge the electrons gives rise to a current through this skipping orbits similarly the quantum picture the system is gapped in the bulk okay and however at the edge because there is a current there are some states in the fermi surface to carry that current and there therefore there are some additional current carrying or chiral states at the edge and then if you think about it for a moment you are really think that well okay that's not too surprising and the reason about this reason for this is that 
Well, you know, you have put in a magnetic field, which means that you have broken time reversal symmetry, and therefore the electrons are perfectly within their lights to pick up a direction. And therefore, we can move in one given direction. And indeed, the direction of this current depends on the direction of the magnetic field. If you reverse the direction of the magnetic field, you are going to reverse the direction of the current. Okay. So essentially, what happens is, but interestingly, what happens here is that the physics at the bulk, that is the presence of a magnetic field and breaking of this time reversal, uh, time reversal invariance, give rise to very interesting physics at the edge. Okay? And this is going to be a bit clearer when I uh, talk about this a bit more. Okay? Uh, but, uh, so let me stop here. I've spoken for almost one hour, 15 minutes. So uh, let me take some questions. And okay, maybe I do one more slide and then I'll stop and take some questions and then I can continue in the next lecture. Actually. So, uh, okay, so one thing to know is that suppose now I do a full scale quantum calculation with this um, um, for calculating this sigma xy. Because you see that this sigma xy is a resistivity. I mean, quantum mechanics, you know, complicated, of course. But we know a way of calculating resistivity for non-interacting particles. Okay. So you can do that. And it turns out that this particular quantity can be exactly calculated. And this was done by uh, Thaulis. This was his seminal contribution to the field. And um, what they showed is that if I consider this wave function, okay, uh, and this wave function can be thought about picking up a Bailey phase in momentum space. And this Bailey phase is what gives rise to, uh, is what leads to quantization of this Hall conductivity. Okay, I'm not going to discuss this statement here, but later when I discuss other uh, Hall effects, I'm going to qualify these statements in a much more detailed manner. Okay, so, uh, so the role of this topology comes in the fact that this sigma xy is e square over h times an integer, and that integer is just the very phase picked up by the electron as it moves in momentum space due to the presence of this magnetic field. Now the point is that, coming back to the earlier slide, so the presence of this topological number, this sigma xy in the bulb, leads to this current at the edge. And this is our first example of a bulk boundary correspondence where a topologically non-trivial winding number in the bulk leads to interesting physics at the edge. And this is going to stay with us for the rest of the set of lectures and where I'm going to try to sort of, you know, elaborate this point in different contexts and see how that comes up. So, uh, okay, I think it's better to stop here because uh, it's really quite a bit of material and I'm going to continue in the next class. So any questions? Uh, hello, sir. Yes. Uh, during the discussion of uh, superconductivity, yeah. uh, you were saying the electrons out, outside the Fermi sphere uh, forms a bound state, okay? On top of the Fermi surface, yes. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, can, uh, why they form the bound, uh, bound state? Can you please explain it physically, mathematically understood? Yeah, no, no. Uh, I haven't really talked about, thank you for that question. I haven't really talked about uh, the reason. So, you see that these two electrons on the top of this uh, Fermi surface, let me just from this uh, here. Okay, so these two electrons on top of this Fermi surface, they see and uh, they see an attractive potential because of the lattice vibration. You know, they are otherwise, we are treating these electrons as free, but they see an attractive potential between them because of this interaction with these uh, electrons. Yeah, sorry, the phonons. Okay, the vibration, lattice vibration quantum. Okay, and because of this attractive interaction, what are they going to do? So normally, if they could have moved in any of the three dimensions in momentum space, 
they will be form a bound state because this attractive interaction is really really weak. Okay. However, it turns out that because of this Fermi surface, they can only move on top of this Fermi sphere. Okay, and therefore their motion is roughly one dimension. Okay, and therefore any weak attractive interaction between them leads to formation of a bound state. You know that in one uh, B, uh, you know even a very small attractive interaction can lead to formation of bound state, right? So the attractive interaction comes because each of these electrons sees the lattice. Okay, that's through for Frolic mechanism. They see an effective. Uh, so this Frolic that I talked about, they see an eff effective attractive interaction between them. And because of this attractive interaction, and because of the fact that the Fermi surface constrains their motion to be roughly one dimensional, uh, you uh, find that they form a bound state. And my second question is that clear or uh, yeah it's kind of yes okay so my second question is uh, when we talk about the thin degree of freedom of the two electrons yes they have to be in a single space correct in this case. uh okay so i haven't discussed it either uh, it's singlet or triplet but that also depends on how it pairs in the real space so if it's is to pairing that is the electrons pairing with same amplitude everywhere around the fermi surface then it has to be a singlet and the reason it has to be a singlet is that the total quantity delta that has to have a fermi unique statistics okay so if it's uh, as equal to zero that is a equal to zero in uh, orbital space it has to be a singlet in uh, spin space so that the total exchange which is uh, so if you exchange these two electrons you should have a minus 1 to the power l plus s which is going to be minus 1 so l plus s for these electrons are always going to be odd uh, so if the pairing is s well which means l equal to 0 it must have a singlet pair okay. but for other type of um, pairing you can have triplet pairings and stuff like that okay Yeah. Hello, sir. I have one question. Yeah, please. Uh, so you discussed about the vortices on this uh, superconducting state, and you argued that the order parameters vanish vanishes at the center of the vortex. And right. from there, you and you from there you argued that the phase uh, the phase of that order parameter that diverges. So that part is not clear because it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that. I I didn't say the phase diverges. All I said is that the phase is ill-defined at that point. It's a singularity. So oh, yeah, singularity. So what does uh, exactly uh, mean? What does that mean? Okay, so let me give you a very simple example. Uh, it's it's really you know. Um, so I was going to say this in the later transparencies, which is now 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 I think I'm going to tackle on Friday. But let me just tell you something very simple. So imagine that you have a two-dimensional coordinate system, okay, x, y. Fine. Yes. 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 Now think of a point x and y in that two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system, okay. But now try to discuss this, just uh, at this point, not by the Cartesian coordinate, but by uh, what do you call the cylindrical coordinates, r and theta. Okay. 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 Now this theta, which is tan inverse of y over x, is well defined at all points except the origin. Yes. Right. Because they are both y and x goes to zero. So yes. tan inverse of y over x is ill defined. Okay. So okay. what what it means is that if r goes to zero, you know uh, the phase uh, cannot be defined properly it's exactly the same with um, this order parameter if its amplitude goes to zero you cannot define the phase at that point that's why i'm calling it uh, the uh, to be a singularity okay Okay. okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, uh, it has some diverging value or uh, something like that. No, like singularity. Means... I mean, we don't know if it diverges or it goes to zero or if it takes the value one and a half. It's uh -huh. different. Okay. Yeah. 
because tan inverse y over x is a quantity which has no well defined limit when both x and y tends to zero unless you define what happens to the ratio of y over x thanks a lot okay so in the next class when we discuss vortices in the in a in a slightly more general sense we are going to see you know how this divergence plays out uh, uh, this singularity plays out okay hello uh, sir i have a question yes please uh, uh, nice talk sir uh, Mm -hmm. So in that uh, probably I missed it. Uh, it's a bit of knife. It's a bit of a bit of a knife question. In in when you are trying to describe that uh, edge state conductance in the in the Hall effect. Uh, let me uh, come to that. Uh, yeah, here. Ha, uh, here, here. Uh, this yes. one. Uh, in that quantum picture in your E versus K diagram, what is this green line? I I probably missed it. Oh, that's uh, sorry, sorry. I, I haven't de really described it. So these uh, angles, you know, the light green and the uh, golden rectangles, those were the Fermi levels. Uh, so sorry, those were the uh, Landau. That's the first Landau band, Landau level, and the second Landau level. The okay. dotted line is the Fermi energy, which of course resides between the two Landau levels because it's a gap system. Okay. Right. And this green line is the edge state dispersion as a function of ky. Oh, so, so it's like a linear linear dispersion. Yeah, is the energy dispersion for the edge states? Okay, thank you. Okay. Hello. Yes. So, uh, where you describe the conductivity sigma? Uh, so can you please be a little louder? Can't hear you. Yeah, is this audible? Yeah. So I am I am asking like when you describe the Hall conductivity sigma x y is equal to e square by h into n. So yeah. you said that n is number of electrons. I I think. No, n no, that's not true. Actually, n here is the it's a. Um, so let me get into this. Yeah, uh, is this the n you are talking about? Yeah, so that's what I'm asking. You said number. No, of this is not. Sorry, this is not the number of electrons. This n is an integer, so it is the number of Landau levels that is filled. If you have one filled Landau level, then this n is one. If you have two Landau levels filled, then this n is two, and so on. So we can calculate this n from this expression, like. Uh, yes. So there is a calculation that Thaulis devised. I haven't shown it to you, but. Uh, uh okay let me see maybe uh towards later part of the course i can come up with a easy way of explaining that okay. yes sir thank you sir sir yeah uh, if it's the number of filled landau levels uh, that gives us the integer or conductivity so mm -hmm. uh, how does fractional hall effect arise fractional integer hall effect uh, can you hold on till friday i have a slide on fractional hall effect need to talk okay. about Okay. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that is okay. So let me just uh, give you a teaser. Fractional Hall effect is one of the systems which essentially is infinitely strongly interacting. Okay, even though um, you know normally uh, semiconductors are not very strongly interacting objects. I mean. But fractional Hall effect is an example of that. That's a teaser, and I'm going to explain myself in the next uh, lecture. Okay, thank you. Sure, there is a uh, there is a question in the chat box. Uh, I can't see the chat I box. Can, I can read it for you. Uh, hold on, hold on. Maybe here is a. Uh, so there is a more. No, actually, Shubhita, it would be useful if you can read it to yeah. me because I really cannot see sure, the chat box. No problem. So it says the this edge state, edge stage, I think it's yeah. probably takes the linear form, or yeah. you can take any other form also. If yes, then how? Uh, okay, so that's a very good question. Uh, so the point is that although I haven't shown it here, uh, if you have this kind of systems, you know, uh, one can show through some very general principles such as gauge invariance that uh, these edge states for the current system has to have a linear form. Okay, uh, it 
in this case particularly for the two dimensional quantum hall it cannot take a quadratic form so this i'm probably going to let me see uh so, uh sorry i don't have it here but maybe it was the later part when i discussed graphing and all that maybe i can uh, qualify this a little bit more okay oh i have it here actually so when i discuss this bulkage correspondence in the next class uh, i'm going to say why this is to have uh, given okay so there is another uh, okay question yeah. the chat box so uh, let me stop sharing this because uh, then i can see the chat box and uh, okay chat how do i so if you go to the chat you can yeah uh, got it so that is it so it's about so let me read the question to everybody i guess in the specific measurement for superconductor can exponential part be related to phonemic specificity as per einstein model uh, no actually uh, the phonons are not gapped and typically d by model gives this uh, what it gives is uh, tq okay uh, it doesn't give no it doesn't give you a hint to the bosonic nature of the ground state it just tells you that the ground state is gapped the electronic ground state is gapped it can be fermi it's a, it can be a it is indeed a fermionic ground state There's another question at the end by uh, what is the significance of the magnetic link scale in quantum hall effect well okay so when you are non interacting electrons this magnetic link scale so what are the parameters so just think of the hamiltonian which let me write this in the chat box okay um, so very sketchily so uh, so here is a very sketchy form of the hamiltonian okay p minus a where this a again uh, very sketchy is e times b times x or something like that okay so this a y is uh, e b x and so on so now if i think of this what are my typical uh, scales in the problem so i have my charge i have my magnetic field and i have my mass okay and h bar of course so out of this i can combine this e b h bar and c the speed of light to form a typical length scale and one can show that that's the only length scale in the problem that you can find find out okay uh, so this means that if you scale your scale everything by that length scale okay uh so anything that happens now happens in units of some dimensional uh, quantity which is x divided by m so this magnetic link scale is the basic link in the problem and uh, that's the importance of it okay uh, that's the only basic link scale in the problem that you can find out so when it comes out to things like density of states which of course being a density depends on the link scale uh you find that it's proportional to 1 over lb square so that magnetic link completely determines the number of available electronic states in your system for example and that's um, you know uh, that's that's essentially one of the significance of this magnetic link uh, hello sir yeah so i see another question just uh, so the topology is just for if we close path we can have a number in well in the current case um this is this is uh, the thing that we take from topology but note that this closed path need not be in real space for vortices it's in real space but for quantum uh, hall effect this is in the space of wave functions okay it's a very abstract space of some sort and in case of graphene and other things we are going to see that this topology can be in momentum space so uh Yes, for it turns out that this Berry phase corresponds to every closed path. Uh, correspond, it tells you that corresponding to every closed path, we can have a number m. But that closed path is in a different space for different systems, and that's what gives rise to the variety of this uh, thing. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, hello, sir. Sir, uh, corresponding to the vortex uh, part with the, we discuss, and yeah. the topological is the topological quantum number independent of magnetic field. The topological number independent of magnetic field. Yes, because uh, you see, as I said, the number of vortex. Okay, so the vortex uh, corresponds to lines uh, which is one flux quanta. Okay, H C over two. now how so how many flux quanta enters the sample okay that depends on the details of the sample okay and the strength of the magnet but for a single line of vortex it's only the flux quanta that's the total amount of flux that enters the sample so it's independent of the magnetic field the magnetic field comes in the uh, of course plays a role it plays a role in the sense that it has to overcome the opposition from the superconducting ground state and it has to be greater than bc1 so that at least one flux quanta can enter the sample uh so the way i was thinking is like that uh, let's say we have a path and uh, mm -hmm. inside the path first put a some value of magnetic field we have only one vortex there and then uh, for the high value of magnetic field let's say we have two vortex in that in that particular path yes then what really happens in that no, case that's not really uh, the right way to look at it first of all if you have two vortices inside the path your total integer is going to be a sum of those two if you are sufficiently away from the um, vortices you are just simply going to pick up the sum of the uh, uh ends you know this topological indices so if you have a vortex and the an anti vortex in the path you are just going to get get zero okay uh, so that's point number 1 Point number two is that this argument really doesn't hold uh, in terms of magnetic field because just imagine that you have a magnetic field which is less than BC one. Okay, then clearly as you circle this path, you are going to pick up zero, but nevertheless you have a magnetic field there. Okay, so vortex is somewhat different from just having a magnetic field. Yeah. No. Okay, sir. The field lines have to penetrate, you know, and the magnetic field has to be greater than certain strength for that. i have a question can you hear me yeah please so if you drive the system non adiabatically so yeah. how so then, what happens to barry phase is it robust to yeah. the non adiabatic uh, okay. so thank you for the question that's a very nice uh, question so what happens is that the barry phase apparently also holds for this non adiabatic stuff but your analysis becomes more complicated because now you have to allow for the possibility of So, if you start from a wave function at a given state n, you have other states n which comes into play. Okay, but there is a very nice paper by Simon and others. Uh, I think it's a physical review letter somewhere in the early 90s, which showed that even in that context, you can define a Berry phase and it's still quantized. Thank you. That's a lot more complicated calculation, but the answer is the same. and that's why typically you know people don't talk about this uh, non adiabatic thing because the adiabatic uh, stuff gives you roughly the same answer okay. i think uh, it will be a good time to uh, terminate the session maybe uh, we can discuss more on the next session so i also like to tell you that if you have any question you can always send a email to krishnan do And yeah, yeah, of course, that's for sure. Uh, so, I can, let me also type my email address uh, in this chat box. So, if you have question, just send it to me. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So, yeah, and I hope to see you guys. Uh, so, if I haven't repulsed you enough, I hope to see you guys in the next class. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Thanks a lot, Krishnan. So, we'll end today's mm -hmm. session. Friday okay. will start at the same time, three thirty. Yeah. Okay. See you guys. Okay. See you.